Imagine you are at the races for the day, and there are a whole lot of different horses to choose from. Which horse do you bet on? You look at the statistics and say, how often has this horse won? But if you do that, chances are it still doesn't give you better odds than just a guarantee of your money back. In fact, you're probably getting less out of it than that. Or else the gambling or the races wouldn't really work for a bookie. So why don't you instead go and bet on every single horse? Well, the game's not that sort of game. It's a game where if you do bet on every single horse, the odds are given in such a way that you're actually going to make a loss. And gambling in general is designed to allow you to make a loss. You might get 90% of your investment back, or you might get 75% or whatever else it is. That's how gambling and raffles and so forth often work. If you consistently make the bets again and again, they tend towards you making less money than you put in. And so it's not a good idea to, in fact, bet on every single horse. So why is it that you are consistently told to diversify your portfolio when it comes to investing in shares? And the reason why is that it's generally seen as not speculation, as not gambling because Western stock markets generally give a return of investment on the actual investments and increase in the value of the general shares listed on, the, on them of let's say 10%, but that's not always and it's not every year. There are years when stock markets go down and years when they go up, which is why they say that investment is long-term. But that relies on a rising tide continuing into the future on the stock markets continuing to increase in their value. When it comes to ordinary businesses, such as one which your friend might set up, chances are that business is going to fail. The vast majority of ordinary businesses fail within a few years. So what's unique about a stock market? Stock markets generally involve public companies. Now public companies undergo extreme regulation. They have to adhere to all sorts of weird regulations and often get audited and have to have a certain amount of money on their books and so forth. They constantly take the money out of their investment either. They generally have to keep the money that they've invested in the company and only take out profits from it when it comes to actually getting dividends. Though you might have someone who's a CEO of a company still making an income from that company even so. So there's ways which people sometimes get around that. But listed companies have to go through a lot more of a rigmarole. They need to be financially healthier quite often. And to do an IPO, you often have to have an underwriter agree to underwrite the stock if the stock is not, in fact, able to be sold at a decent rate for the company. So you have to have people with financial ability buy into it. And generally speaking, a public listed company has to, in fact, report on their earnings, report on all sorts of things and be audited and have to keep to certain standards. If they fall below those standards, they often will be delisted as a company. So it's got benefits to that. And overall, with the rule of large numbers with many different bets, the companies which survive and stay on the stock market versus those which have to be removed from it often are growing at a certain rate every year which gives you the idea of if you bet in the overall stock market in 1600 or 1900 or whatever it is, you might have made a massive, massive return on investment. But that's not always the case. That relies on the algorithm of public companies being a certain type of more stable company to be able to be that in the first place, and listed companies having to have that same sort of stability and those same sort of procedures in place in order for that growth to happen. And even then, listed or, or public companies often have to delist or become private companies because they're no longer able to stay within that. So it's actually a very selected type of a set of companies which are involved in a stock market in the West. But would you invest in Venezuela's stock market or Zimbabwe's or China's? And if you had, would you be getting the same returns on investment? The problem with all of these countries is they don't have the same property rights as you'd have in the West and they don't have the same scrutiny or standards of companies as you'd have in the West. Chinese companies are often 
highly encouraged to fudge their figures and to fudge the type of production going on. And the type of scrutiny involved in these markets is a very different type of scrutiny. And overall, because of the extreme corruption within the governments and the nepotism and all sorts of other problems and the weak property rights involved, an investment in such a market, no matter how diversified, is very unlikely to be a good investment, especially if you go by uh, places such as Standard & Poor's or Moody's investment advice. So diversification isn't necessarily a good thing. And China, for instance, because the Chinese stock market is such a bad investment, and because peer-to-peer -peer lending turned out to be such a bad investment, people generally started investing very highly in properties. Now, the properties were often very badly put together. They had weak cement. You can look at a Chinese property, which is three years old, and it looks like it is much, much more than three years old. It's quite bizarre. And it's crumbling quite often. They often just created facades for investors. And there are ghost cities or at East Coast neighborhoods throughout China where no one lives, but people are bought as investments. And that's not real production. The fundamentals of those buildings are just as likely to crumble as the buildings themselves. They're bad investments. They're not real production. They're sort of a fake investment. And that overall creates problems. And the Chinese economy itself has so much propaganda behind it within the Chinese government. And so many figures which are somewhat fudged due to the corruption on the local level that it's very difficult to see what's really happening with a place like China or Venezuela or so forth. So diversification doesn't help in such a market very much. And prices do not always go up and stock markets do not always go up. Western stock markets generally have, but they have very specific algorithms which govern them and which have kept them going for centuries really. And if you were to try and apply those algorithms and to say you're betting on this and that uh, specific company succeeding and bet in 1600 in that company, chances are that company is out of business now. So it's a, the general stock market continuing to go up, but the stock market itself is designed to weed out companies which have bad fundamentals. So Obviously, a lot of those companies in the stock market, their bad fundamentals catch up with them, and then they're no longer in the stock market, or they go under, or trading gets stopped on their stocks, and so forth. And so you can make massive losses on a stock market if you are going about it wrong. And so because stock markets are generally following this type of algorithm of only healthier companies can go on them, Generally, they're slightly, slightly slanted towards a better return of, say, 10% a year if you're properly diversified within it. And this is due to the large, large numbers. A classical example of it involved two professors, and one told the other, if I, I will bet you $10 or something along those lines, and if, if this coin... Um, lands on heads or tails or whatever it would be, that if you win, you take, say, $20, and if I win, I take 10 and the other professor was not prepared to make the bet, whatever it is. Then they suggested doing it a 100 times, and the other professor wanted to do it. And the takeaway the professor making the bet uh, took from it was that the other professor was illogical. Because if a bet is in your favor, and like gambling, which is never really in your favor, that you should continually take the type of bet in your favor because overall it will equal out and you'll win most of the bets even if you lose some of them. And this is a sort of idea with the law of large numbers. The casino, your best uh, odds are to generally just bet everything in a single bet because after that single bet, Every single bet after that, your odds of getting a good return go down further and further until it hits maybe 90% or 70% or 60% of what you came with is what you come back with. And the more bets you make, the worse it is because the scales are tipped against you. But with a stock market, it's designed so that the scales are at least slightly tipped 
tipped in your favor. And so if they're slightly tipped in your favor, you are more likely to get a small amount more out if you diversify properly than if you don't. But that's only if the market actually is continuing to gradually go up. And that's not always necessarily going to be the case. For instance, if an entire economy is going down or if a stock market is overvalued because people want to be able to invest their money in something due to a fear of money being printed by governments, and if a economy is not producing more and therefore a lot of the growth in stocks is not list, uh, linked to actual production but rather linked to investors buying it on the presumption that the stocks will go up then there's a possible problem to be found today stock markets involve often overvalued stocks the amount you get from your dividend from the stock, the amount you paid for keeping the stock as an owner of the stock is actually quite low for most stocks. And a lot of stocks such as say Amazon or other types of companies often are based not on paying out a dividend, but continually putting the money back into the investment and often undercutting uh, competitors to keep going. So the actual money, which is realized out of it, it's often simply of, the stock going up and the amount it gets out is often quite small compared to in history so we might well be seeing a bubble and the problem is that a lot of people are investing in stock and housing and everything else for fear of the currency that they have in their bank going down and that's due to countries printing a lot of more money and production being reduced within countries and obviously your money is actually worth the production in the country divided by the amount of money which is printed of that currency and in circulation. Of course, banks will often loan out a lot more money than they actually have, which again dilutes the value of any money which is had. So a global economy where more and more spent on compliance and on productive costs, things such as green energy, you often have to get rid of a car because it's a petrol car and the costs are just continuing to pay the taxes for it just don't make it worth it. So you have to move to say an electric car and, and scrap that uh, petrol car or to diesel car and scrap that petrol car. But that actually takes a real value out of an economy and makes say your euros worth less. Uh, there's a lack of supply of raw materials and our production and a lack of logistics to transport these sort of things. A lot of the uh, carrier a type of ships where the cargo ships were actually scrapped because they couldn't keep going with the lockdown. So you have problems with that. In America and other places, you have people being paid without having to work for the money which they would otherwise be working for. So they're refusing to do lower level work, which why wouldn't they refuse if they don't have to? So you often have restaurants unable to hire waiters. You have people unable to hire people to clean toilets or things like that because the type of UBI is actually worth more to them than actually going through all of that difficulty to continue working. You have a shrinking global working population with skilled workers within much of the world. And you can't simply replace a population in a country with an immigrant population necessarily and expect that it will be a easy mix because often the education levels of countries where people immigrate from are not the same as the country they're immigrating to and even if they do that do that immigration their children often are they have the same amounts of children as the people local to that country so it creates problems and it also creates a, bra a, gr a brain drain from the countries in which they immigrate out of now green mandates also affect products quite badly and also the change within Western uh, countries from a duty to shareholders, from directors, towards these really complex sort of uh, duties to do, towards all sorts of different communities, which allow directors to say, okay, we're putting this money towards charity, this and that, which allows more possible corruption and more leeway to directors than they otherwise would have in the past, and which has the danger of slightly reducing returns which could in fact make diversification less of a good investment in such stock markets where what you're getting out of it is slightly, slightly an advantage versus what could otherwise happen in the future. 
also hiring is often now no longer based on who's the best person for a job, but based on all sorts of other categories, uh, whether it is based on political connections or based on other sort of things which are not actually connected to who's best for a job. And Price's law, which I've mentioned quite a few times before, means that the square root of a population produces half its wealth, half its production. And if that square root is not in that country, you have big problems. And South Africa is a good example of capital flight creating extreme poverty and extreme inequality. South Africa has some of the highest uh, income inequality in the world. And the reason is that a lot of its most skilled people have left. And one of the reasons many of them have left is due to human resources regulations, which make it very difficult for a company to hire the person they necessarily want for a job. And so they instead don't hire that specific person and that specific person says, well, I'm highly skilled, I'm going to work elsewhere and the company doesn't fill the role or they do other sorts of things. So countries with that sort of approach, which is increasingly being added to very big companies in the West have a problem. And if companies in fact, as is often happening today, are very politically connected and very connected to lobbies, you can often find that because companies aren't allowed to fail and because certain types of products are in favor of others, that the companies which remain in power are not the ones which are necessarily those which are able to grow as fast, which again affects the ability of diversification within a stock market to actually be so beneficial. Um, things such as fatherlessness have increased. Now, children who grow up without their father are much more likely to engage in crime and land in jail, to have low academic achievements and a lot of other problems because children often need both the mother and the father to raise them. And you also have the problem of reduced marriage rates. Now, it's a little kept secret that most of the wage gap between men and women is between, in fact, married men and everyone else, because married men are often deeply, deeply encouraged by their wives and children and so forth to do a lot more work and a lot more overtime and to take a lot more risk in order to support their family. A married man is likely to earn something like 10 times what an unmarried man earns or an unmarried man is much more likely to be happy to make a lot less. And you often see the types of memes on the internet of men who live in an apartment without a bed, they just have a mattress or so forth. And it's because it's often just uh, something which is workable for them. But if they marry, then they're less likely to have that. And also married men are much less likely to engage in revolution as the bare branches studies have shown. So when there's a possible bubble, when the fundamentals of economies and the laws change in such a way that they don't necessarily favor the most competitive arrangements of companies and other such things, you might have a problem. You might also see that there's a bubble due to people thinking the stock market will always go up by 10% if you just diversify. And so a lot more money is put into a stock market, but that money doesn't necessarily return that investment, people simply think it's going to increase by 10%, so they pay them more, uh, they're 10% higher. But it looks like a lot of stocks are hectically overvalued by looking at the fundamentals of the actual economy and actual companies involved, which suggests that maybe people are simply trusting the idea of diversification and putting their money in the stock market, thinking it's diversified, I'm guaranteed a return. But the problem is that that's how you create a bubble, especially if you have a situation where the globe is actually producing a lot less actual production, actual products, actual things which increase the well-being of mankind, which is what stocks are actually based on and money is actually based on. So you have a possible problem. And in such a situation, you actually are better off possibly looking at the fundamentals of companies, looking at their returns, looking at the industry they're in and choosing the actual stocks which are involved and the companies involved, which are more likely to survive and to continue on. Because the stock market going up 
actually involves a lot of companies being weeded out during the process over the years. That's why the stock market is going up overall. But if you bought specific shares in specific companies in 1600, you're not necessarily going to be wealthy now because those companies might have gone under and been removed from the stock markets. So it's sort of a misnomer to say that investment in shares is guaranteed to give you a 10% increase year on year. If you diversified it, you constantly have to diversify it. And that also relies on a rising tide and the market always going up. But where markets have continued to go up, 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 and not stopping to go up because people are told you just need to diversify and it's a guaranteed uh, increase, you might find that what stocks are actually worth is actually a lot less than what people pay for it. Now, what they're worth is what they go back to when the fundamentals of the stock come into play again. So you might find that you're based on the horses after you take away the fees you pay on your trading and everything else might actually long term be a bad bet because you're betting in a market where people just assume it's always going to go up and haven't looked at the fundamentals. And so what you might actually need to be doing with investments is looking at the fundamentals of any company or any group of companies that you're investing in, because those investments might actually end up going down and down quite badly because the idea of diversification is you are involved in a bet and you are the house in the case of the stock markets because your chances of getting more back increased. But if you are basing your bet on the fact that it's a guaranteed increase and the people coming after you are basing that as well, that creates the sort of idea of a pyramid scheme. It creates the idea of you're creating a bubble, you're creating something which has gone up too much because it's not based on the fundamentals and the stock market of the present day seems a lot higher than it should be. But at the same time, a lot of people are investing in stocks or houses or everything else for fear of inflation of the currency, which is a justified fear because of all of the printing of currency and the reduction in production, which the currency is worth the amount of bills of a currency divided by the production and bring into effect and looking at the fact that banks also will loan a lot more money than they actually have in the books, which again will diversify, well, what would the word be? Would also dilute the value of that currency further. So a lot of money is being invested for fear of loss of money due to inflation, but also that money is not necessarily being invested in a stock market, which is relying on its fundamentals the stocks might be worth a lot less than what is actually being bet on because a lot of people betting their money are just saying, okay, diversify and it'll all be fine. But it's not necessarily going to all be fine. There might be problems which come out of it. And you might be just betting on the horses for every single horse being bet on. But that might create problems in the long term because there are horses which lose and are removed from stock markets through their losses and they're horses which are bought up by the companies and so forth because of those losses, but also stock markets as a whole can go into bubbles. And if people think the stocks are only ever going to go up, that's the danger which comes into play of a bubble. If what stocks invested in are based on ideology and regulations bring that into effect so that cheap energy such as petroleum and so forth go out, but what they replace with are not as capable of creating growth, you might have problems with those type of economies. If a very well regulated economy becomes badly regulated or over regulated, you might see a loss of that so called 10% that you might get from a lot of Western markets. So what actually comes out of this is there's an underlying speculation that markets will always increase and so forth. And it's based on that algorithm, which usually works out. But the algorithm is being changed lately and a lot of the fundamentals are being changed lately. And so it might be a better idea not just to diversify, but to actually look at the stocks which you're investing in, because you might be investing money which you're not going to get back in the long run. And you might be having a negative bet where you're actually getting less money out than you uh, just like if you went to the races or if you went to a casino, you might actually be speculating on an underlying thing, which 
is not guaranteed. It's simply based on an algorithm in certain environments, which might be changing, might also not be changing, but it might in fact be changing. None of this, of course, is financial advice and uh, based on the shares you want to bet on, invest in the shares you want to invest on, uh, uh, invest in, but be aware that it's a good idea to actually look at the finances of companies and their under and their underlying fundamentals and the market to have a knowledge of the market and simply to blindly invest in every share which is available.